looking now at the book of Daniel. And we're looking at chapter 8. We're going to finish chapter 8 this morning, Lord willing, and do an overview, a quick overview of chapter 9, and begin showing the relationship between chapters 8 and 9 in the prophecy of Daniel. So open your Bible to Daniel chapter number 8. <coughs> and let's get started. You should have received your notes for this morning's lesson. If you did not receive them by email as a registered student of this course, then you can uh, raise your hand. One of our ushers will get you a copy of the student notes, and you can fill in the blanks there if you enjoy doing that kind of thing. <coughs> if you don't enjoy filling in blanks, you can ask for the teacher's notes, and they have all the blanks filled in. <laughs> all right? I find about half the people like to do the fill-in, and half the people don't like it, so... We try to, you know, we just try to please. Amen. <laughs> All right. In the book of Daniel, chapter number eight, we are studying prophecy. We are looking at a period of prophetic history called the last days. The last days began at Pentecost, as you know. And they run through to the coming of the Lord. Then there are some subsets of prophetic periods that are identified in the Bible. One of them identified by Jesus Christ in Luke 21 called the Days of wrath upon this people. That began in AD 70 at the destruction of the temple. Then there's, uh, we, and those have already passed. We're already into those. We are in the last days, and we are in the days of wrath upon this people. And we're moving toward a period called the time of the end. And that begins as we have shown, and we will show further today with the rise of Little Horn when he comes along and takes out. Three of the ten horns of the ten horned beast. If you don't know what I'm talking about, then um, you need to study because we're going to be going into all that and helping you with that kind of thing. And then um, the next prophetic period is called the 70th week. And we begin a very careful study of that in the next lesson. We introduce it today. That's Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy. This obviously is the 70th week of the 70 week prophecy. And then within that period, there begins what's called the last end of the indignation. And that is triggered by the abomination of desolation. Finally, then we come to what's called the consummation, as Daniel identified it in Daniel chapter 9, 27. Following that, we have what's called the period, uh, the millennial reign of Christ, which is a misnomer because Christ's reign is not limited to a millennial. It's forever and ever and ever. The period called the millennium is actually marked biblically by the banning or the banishment of Satan in the bottomless pit, and then his loosing 1,000 years later. In any event, we're trying to clarify all that stuff. We've been looking at this section of our prophetic chart for a while now, and then when we got into Daniel 8, we began expanding our view all the way up to and including the abomination of desolation. So let's go ahead and get started. Amen. All right, we're going to do our review. In 608 B.C., God transferred something called the kingdom from Israel and gave it to what empire, what nation? Babylon. And the Holy Spirit, through the apostle, uh, through the apostle, amen, through the prophet Jeremiah, identified that king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah, Nebuchadnezzar, all right? Nebu. Remember, we had that guy come and preach for us, and he called him Nebu or whatever. But anyway, <coughs> so uh, Babylon is the first of the empires in the period called the Times of the Gentiles, which began when God took the kingdom from Israel and gave it to the Gentiles. And the first nation bearing the kingdom was Babylon. And the first king of that kingdom was Nebuchadnezzar. And that's... Uh, what he dreamed, and he had a dream of a golden head and a silver upper torso and the brass belly and thighs, the legs of iron, the feet of iron mixed with miry clay and the ten toes of iron and um, miry clay. And so the second section represents the transfer of the kingdom from Babylon to, drum roll please, Persia. Often we refer to this as the Medo-Persian Empire, but it did finally become Persia. And that, by the way, is indicated in the Bible. And in, uh, in, in Gen uh, keep doing that in Daniel chapter number eight. So Persia, that began in 539 B.C. or 70 years after 
the 608 thing, that 70 year prophecy of Jeremiah was fulfilled when the kingdom was declared by him to have been transferred to Nebuchadnezzar and they would serve Nebuchadnezzar and serve his kingdom for 70 years. 70 years expired in 539 and that's when the kingdom was transferred from Babylon to Persia and the first king of this kingdom also was named in the Bible. And his name is Cyrus. Very good. Well, we put along there for a while in history. We come to a period uh, where the, the kingdom is going to transfer now from the second to the third kingdom. And that third kingdom is identified as Grisha or Greece. That's right. And the first king is named in Daniel, right? Wrong. He's not named in Daniel. Now, Nebuchadnezzar is named. Cyrus is named. Yes, you do find his name even in Daniel. But he was prophesied back in Isaiah 44, 28 and 45, 1. So the first king of the first kingdom was named Nebuchadnezzar. The first king of the second kingdom was named Cyrus. But the third kingdom, the first king of the third kingdom is not named. However, he is identified with a description so complete nobody can miss him. And who is he? Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great was the first king of the third kingdom. Now, why didn't God name him? In your multiple choice, you have God had amnesia. He was tired that day and just didn't want to look that far in the future. I mean, why? Okay. Obviously, it's because God doesn't know him. When I say God doesn't know him, what do I mean? Does it mean God said, I, surprise to me? No, I mean the same thing it meant when Jesus said, I never knew you. Depart from me, you cursed. Right? You workers of iniquity, I don't know you. He doesn't take knowledge of those that aren't his. You see, Nebuchadnezzar was called God's servant. Cyrus was called God's shepherd. Alexander is neither named nor identified as related to God in any way. He was a satanic ruler. He was full of the devil. He had a lot of spiritual power upon his life, but it wasn't from God. He was an extraordinary man in many ways. And as soon as he rose to zenith of power, God killed him, didn't he? Just a he didn't even get a chance to go on and rule in his kingdom, did he? All he got to do was conquer the whole world, bring it under his power, and then he died. And God broke his kingdom into how many kingdoms? Four kingdoms. That's right. And then, uh, so, so far it's interesting. We've noticed God names the first king of the first empire. He names the first king of the second empire. He identifies the, third, the first king of the third empire very expressly, but doesn't name him. So something interesting is developing here. Hmm. Let's go to the fourth kingdom. The fourth kingdom is mystery. Very interesting. Everybody thinks the fourth kingdom is Rome because they know how to count. Babylon was followed by Persia, was followed by Greece, was followed by Rome. So everybody calls it Rome. But the Bible didn't call it Rome. God didn't name it Rome. Another interesting thing is, as a matter of fact, this fourth kingdom continues all the way until the coming of Christ, but Rome did not. Could be a reason he didn't call it Rome. This fourth kingdom is interesting. It's unique in a lot of ways. <laughs> oh, and by the way, another really, really interesting thing about this fourth kingdom, the prophecy of Daniel concentrates on which king of the fourth kingdom? The last one. The one that rises up at the end of the fourth kingdom. Very interesting. What's going on here? Well, a lot of interesting things we really get into it in Daniel chapter 9, but we're going to give you just a little bit now. We, this is review, but... Uh, you know, in, in all review, there's a little something new, typically you know, a little something sprinkled in there. So this fourth kingdom, you have this transition time from the third to the fourth kingdom, which is kind of vague. All through the New Testament, you keep hearing about the Greeks, the Greeks, the Greeks, the Jews and the Greeks, the Jews and the Greeks. You never hear about the Jews and the Romans. So the Greek influence in the world at the time of the New Testament was very, very strong and very prominent. And there's no declaration in the Bible that the Romans took over. 
We know they did. We know that they were the ruling empire at the time, but was the kingdom given to them? This is the question. The kingdom was transferred from Babylon to Persia. The kingdom was transferred from Persia to Greece. But was the kingdom transferred from Greece to Rome? Hmm. Well, actually... No. Here's what happened. Right about that time, Jesus shows up. Doesn't he? Now, those argue about when the Roman Empire began. It began in 63 B.C. as indicated on your chart, which is when Pompey conquered Jerusalem. Um, you know, was it when Caesar crossed the Rubicon? Was it when? I mean, there are all these different theories about when the Roman Empire started. One of the reasons it's so vague and one of the reasons historians have a hard time figuring out when, the, when this uh, Rome, Roman Empire began is because, because it's vague. There's no clear-cut moment when it happened. Like there was when went from Babylon to Persia. No problem. The real clear-cut historical marker. From Persia to Greece, no problem. A real clear-cut historical marker. When it comes to the third to the fourth kingdom, it's all fuzzy. It's blurry. But we do know that Jesus Christ was born after the third kingdom had been broken into four and after Daniel 11, much of it had been fulfilled. So Jesus Christ gets born. At a time in history when Satan was able to say, all the kingdoms of the world are mine. Oh, oh, wait a minute. So the kingdoms of the world had been transferred to Satan at this time. We have Bible for that. The Bible says that this time in history, Satan had the kingdoms of the world in his power. Did he have the kingdoms of the world in his power at the time of Nebuchadnezzar? No. Nebuchadnezzar did. Did he have the kingdoms of the world under his power in the time of Cyrus? No, Cyrus did. Did he have the kingdoms of the world under his power with Alexander? Aha. Now... You're beginning to see some things. This is what's going on. You look at Daniel. There's war going on in the heavens between the angels over control of these kingdoms. That's what's going on. Daniel 10. And this war's going on. Satan's trying to get his hand on the dominion that he gave Adam, that God gave to Adam. He's been trying to get it ever since. He finally has got to a place where all the kingdoms of the world are in his power. He knew the prophecies of Daniel. He was shopping for the man through whom he would rule the world. But God killed him. Alexander the Great broke, killed him, divided his kingdom. So Satan's in kind of limbo here. So when Jesus comes along, the, the devils go, what are you doing here? Have you come to torment us before the time? Right? So Satan goes to Jesus and says, how about you? You want the job? I'll give all the kingdoms to you. Jesus said, no, the Bible teaches that Jesus went to the cross spoiled all principality and power. The Bible said earlier that he bound the strong man, spoiled his house. The Bible says Jesus came and took the kingdoms from Satan into his own power. So when he rose again, he said, all power in heaven and earth is mine. At the beginning of the Gospels, Satan is saying, they're all mine. You want them? Jesus said, no. He took the cross instead, died on the cross, rose again, and then declared, they're all mine now. So the king of the fourth kingdom is actually Jesus Christ. He's the king. He is the Lord of lords and the king of kings. He is the ruler. And he rules now on the right hand of the throne of the Father on high. <laughs> and we'll get into some more of that uh, in this morning's message. But we'll stop right there with regard to that. Jesus planted in the earth something he called the church. <clears throat> and that church was given the keys of the kingdom. And now we preach the gospel which opens the doors of the kingdom of Christ to any who will repent and believe. And they come in and they're translated into the kingdom of God's dear son. But the worldlings are angry. No, you can't have it. We will not, we will not rule. I mean, we will not be ruled by that man. Luke chapter 19. Psalm 2. Why do the heathen rage? The people imagine of vain things. The kings of the earth gather themselves together and so on, blah, 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 right? That's what, that's what we live in right now. <laughs> By the way, blah, blah, blah is nowhere in the Bible. I just, okay. So that's where we are right now. 
And um, when, the, when the rapture happens and the Lord's people are taken out, then of course Christ will come. All the kings of the world will be destroyed. Jesus Christ will rule and reign from the throne of his father David on the earth. That reviews chapter 2. Let's review chapter 7. You remember the first beast that rose from the sea was a lion with wings of an eagle. The wings of the eagle are plucked off. The lion stands on its hind feet, given the heart of a man. Then rises the bear, three ribs in its mouth. We believe those ribs represent, we, of course, we are sure the lion represents Iraq, modern day Iraq. In the past, it was Babylon. <coughs> the wings of the eagle, it's hard for us not to see America being attached to Iraq at this, at this juncture, but you've heard me say over and over again, these things have a tendency to be interpreted within the context of the history in which they're interpreted. So today, it would look like Iraq. I mean, it would look like the, America is, is the wings of the eagle. But it might be something different later on. We don't know. So we're not going to go there right now. Beyond that, because I do give some very definitive uh, answers to some of those questions later in our study. The bear is Medo-Persia, or the Persian Empire, or Iraq and Russia. We, we believe China is also involved in that. <laughs> then you have the, uh, uh, the Eastern European powers, which would be Greece, Turkey, Lebanon, Syria, and Egypt represented in the four-headed leopard. And then we have the fourth beast that will rise, which is the Western powers, we believe. By the way, that's an assumption. We don't have anything in the Bible that says directly, this is it. But it is an assumption based on some good, good arguments. So we accept it at present. I'll give you a more full idea of what this fourth beast is about later on. <clears throat> but it's not America. America might be part of it, <clears throat> but it's a ten-horned or a ten-king alliance. And it's a spiritual beast. It's unlike anything else. <clears throat> I used a, a, a pig or a hog and a devil's head. I just created that. That's not, the Bible doesn't describe it this way. I just made that up. <laughs> okay. It's interesting that the Bible comes up with a lion with the wings of an eagle and a bear raised up on one side with three ribs and a four-headed leopard with four wings of a fowl. But when it comes to the fourth beast, he, he says effectively, there's not a creature in the earth I could use and combine in any way to depict this thing. It's so weird. So that's why I call it mystery. <clears throat> Little horn shows up <clears throat> among the ten, takes out three, establishes himself as a power. That's the beginning of the career of Little horn as it's prophesied in the Bible. That's when he starts his thing and begins to rise in power and to wax great. He shoots off his big mouth. God destroys the fourth kingdom, takes the dominion from the other three. They are all folded together in two. Now we reach forward to Revelation 17 and we have the rise of the scarlet colored beast that brings all of the kingdoms of the world under the power of the great whore, <clears throat> which would today be uh, the Roman Catholic system. By the time we get to the fulfillment of this prophecy, the Roman Catholic system might look more like Islam. You saw how they kept together recently, right? Islam and the Catholics got together and they kissed and made up and it was very sweet. <clears throat> then we're going to have the 70th week. And we'll be looking at that when we get to Daniel 9. This whore riding the scarlet beast rides, is developed just coming into the 70th week and then rides through the first, week, first half of the week. She's destroyed at the middle of the week at which time the abomination of desolation is set in place and then rises the one world empire. Revelation 13. Jesus Christ comes, wipes out the whole thing. And uh, I don't know how they got this photo of Jesus coming. It was pretty neat. Okay, anyway. <laughs> Babylon, Persia, Greece, mystery. Okay. Here's, uh, here gives you some historical perspective. <clears throat> it's in this 539 period that the ram shows up. This is a, a review, by the way, of Daniel 8 now. Now we're going to Daniel 8. The ram shows up, and that represents the combination of the Medes and the Persians. One horn was bigger than the other, came up later. That's Cyrus. At first, Darius, his uncle, was the elder and the dominant ruler of that kingdom. But very soon after they began conquering the nations north and north uh, uh, west, I'm sorry, northeast of Babylon, pretty soon Cyrus became the more dominant of the two. And so then comes Greece. You know, Alexander the Great destroys the ram, stomps, stamps him into the ground. 
His horn is broken. Four horns come out of it. Out of one of those horns comes little horn. And that's basically what we're being told in Daniel chapter 8. All right. <clears throat> but then we have this enigmatic 2300 days prophecy embedded in Daniel 8. We'll be looking at that again today and finishing up with Daniel 8 as we look more closely and particularly at the 2300 day prophecy. Open your Bible to Daniel 8 and look with me at, at verses 13 and 14. Daniel 8, 13 and 14. This is the prophecy of the 2300 days. The Bible says in Daniel 8, uh, Verses, beginning at verse 13, Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he said unto me, Unto two thousand and three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. That's an interesting situation here. We Daniel 8 is usually referred to as the prophecy of the ram and the he goat. It's actually a mistake. It's not called that. That is what he saw in the vision, but that isn't what this vision is called. This vision is called the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation. The angel Gabriel refers to it as the vision of the evening and the morning which was told. You'll see that in verse 26. So the Holy Spirit identifies the vision of Daniel 8 specifically as the vision of the evening and the morning, which was told. And the only part of this vision Daniel had that was told is this part right here where one saint was talking to another saint and so on. And they had this conversation. And that's the vision of the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation. Or that's what it's concerning, I should say. That's what it, that's what it regards. Okay, so we look at a, a combination of Daniel uh, 8 with 7. And so I just want to go through this real quick. I forgot I had this in here. I'm sorry. I thought I was ready to get on with it. Let's go ahead. We'll do this real fast. Vroom, pew, bing. How about that? Those sound effects help, don't they? The sound effects don't help. Okay. Okay, and then we have uh, Daniel 2 through 8 review. Again, I thought I had removed these out of here. Let me just go ahead and cycle through these, and we'll get on with it. Because we did this last time. We don't need to do this again. And I want to get on into looking particularly at. Uh, but what this does is this shows, all, shows them all together. Daniel 2, the, the dream of Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, Daniel 7, the rising of the four beasts. Daniel 8, the ram, and then the he-goat. And it shows how they kind of combined together to tell the story that they tell, okay? And we're looking at the beginning of the time of the end is when Little Horn starts his career. She rises up. And then we go to the abomination of desolation. All right, and that begins a period called last end of the indignation. All right, so there you go. I expected a, a round of applause. I'm just teasing. I, did. I was just kidding. All right. Now, Daniel chapter 8, 13 and 14. We're looking at the, uh, uh, the vision of the evening and the morning. Verse 26. This vision of the evening and the morning is a vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation. The vision, the duration of the vision is given or stipulated to be 2300 days this is not about how um, long before the vision is fulfilled. That's not what it's being asked. How long is this vision? This vision has a beginning and it has an ending point. What is the duration of this vision? And it's 2,300 days from the time Little Horn shows up to the time he commits the abomination of desolation. That's what we're going to show you. Let's get at it. A little bit of review here. You're, if you've got your notes with you, you'll see it says review. And you don't have to fill in these blanks. But it, your notes also tell you when you've got to start filling in blanks. You'll see it. Gabriel refers to the vision as the vision of the evening and the morning, which was told, as we pointed out. And as I said, the only part of the vision is that which was, that was told is in verses 13 and 14. Gabriel calls the vision at Shushan the vision of the evening and the morning. I'll look at that. 
The Hebrew words that are translated evening and morning are Erev and Boker. And Erev means evening and Boker means morning. All right. So these Hebrew words are right there in verse 26 of Daniel 8 when it's translated the vision of the Erev Beboker. Why am I laboring on that? Well, because in Daniel 8, 14, the word days translates the same Hebrew expression. Erev Beboker. Why is that important? Boy, I wish I had time right now to tell you how beautifully our, our translation is, has been handled. What an elegant job these guys did. I believe helped by the Holy Spirit because it's just amazing how they constructed this thing in such a way that within the language of the English Bible, we can kind of get the Hebrew message. Well, I guess that's what preservation is all about. But anyway, we're dealing with that on Sunday nights. Um, but here you, you see that in Daniel 8.14, it talks about days. In Daniel 8.26, it clarifies. We're talking about 24-hour days. The word yom, which is another word in Hebrew for the word day, is sometimes used to speak of an era or an epoch or an expanded or an extended period of time. But the expression erev beboker is never used that way. It is only used to speak of a 24-hour period. So these are 2,300 24-hour days. That's extremely important to rightly understand the, the, the prophecy. The question again is, how long shall be the vision? And the language indicates interest in the duration of the vision. And the first thing we must understand, as I pointed out already, is that these are literal 24-hour 24, 24 days. And all that is left then to ascertain is what marks the beginning and what marks the end of the vision. Well, let's take a look at that. Since we're talking about 2,300 literal 24-hour days, well, we cannot begin with the rise of the Persian Empire. Somebody says, well, Daniel 8, the vision of Daniel 8 starts with the rise of the, of the, of the Persian Empire in the symbol of the ram. So we must begin the 2300 days then. Well, if it's 2300 literal days, that creates a problem because the ram showed up in 539 and 2300 days. If you reckon it by Bible years of 360 days, you have six years, four months, and 20 days. Now, if you insist on using the 365.25 day calendar that we use now, then you've got six years, three months, and 15 and a half days. It won't matter in any event. You add about six years or take away about six years. Am I right? That's about what you do here. Okay, so 539 minus 6 gives us 533 B.C. We, the prophecy hasn't been fulfilled yet, has it? So that would say the 2300-day prophecy that begins when Little Horn shows up and when Little Horn commits the abomination of desolation has already happened. Well, it hasn't already happened. So anyway, you can't start with a ram as a point. I don't think anybody here wanted to. Anybody here want to start with a ram? Good. Then you have the goat. Should we start the prophecy with the goat? Is that when the prophecy starts? Is when the goat shows up. Well, he showed up in 331 B.C. You take away 6, you get 325 B.C. And you get the same problem. And even if you go along with some of these guys who insist that the 2300 days are year for days, and so you got 2300 years, even if you do that, it doesn't work. Because if you have a B.C. date, 331, you add that to the A.D. date to get the total number of years in the span. Am I right? Yes, I'm right. So you would add 331 to 2019, and you get 50 years too much. 2,350. Now, obviously, it's not going to work if you go back to 539. That's really going to be a problem. All right, so my point is you don't start with the ram, and you don't start with the goat. And we knew that anyway because the prophecy makes it clear where we start, as we shall see. These matters are backdrop for the point that Daniel is making with regard to where does Little Horn come from? Daniel 7 gives us an indication of when in prophetic history he shows up. Daniel 8 gives us insight into from where does he come? And he comes from one of the four horns of the goat. And we know because the Bible refers to him as the Assyrian that he must come from the Syrian horn. 
see? And there's other information that helps us narrow it down even more. We'll get into it later. The beginning. Now you start putting in some blanks here. The beginning of the vision refers to the beginning of the prophetic career of Little Horn. And the end of the vision refers to the event that occasioned the distress of Daniel, the removal of the daily sacrifice and the abomination that make it desolate. So the prophecy of the 2300 days reveals that from the day Little Horn subdues three of the ten kings identified with the fourth kingdom to the central event of virtually all of Daniel's prophecies, which is the abomination of desolation, shall be 2,300 literal 24-hour uh, days. So from the time he shows up, the time he does it, when he gets right there, it's a little too small for, for the screen. I just now noticed that. But when uh, what happened there is Little Horn showed up out of one of the horns of the four, uh, one of the four horns of the goat, and they went over there through history, whew, thousands of years, whew, flew across time, and he landed on that fourth beast. He took out three of the horns, and there he is on the head of that fourth beast. From that moment, you count 2,300 days to the abomination of desolation. All right. What is the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation? That becomes the question. Open your Bible. Daniel chapter 8, verse 9. What is this vision that's described as concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation? Well, let's look at it. Verse 9 of chapter 8. And out of one of them, that is one of the four horns, out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great. So it starts at the time the horn begins waxing great, exceeding great. He does this toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. And it waxed great, even to the host of heaven. And it cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. This is an amazing thing. Now you could take your pick which way you want to read this. If he's casting down stars, I guess President Trump is going to be successful at launching space wars or space army. And somehow these guys are going to be able to take stars down and then stomp on them. So if you want to take it symbolically and say destroy stars, okay. So somebody's going to make a star destroyer. All right, now we're getting into Star Wars and all that kind of weird stuff. Okay, this is pretty strange. Or... Or we understand it from the representation of stars in the Bible being used for angelic beings. And we know that that's true. Satan drew one third of the stars of heaven with him. And we know that meant or means these stars are angels that followed him in his rebellion. And, and then you've got the seven stars in the right hand of Christ, which are the seven angels. So these angels, uh, if they're angelic beings then that suggests that little horn has extraordinary spiritual power able to have influence over powerful angels and take them and strike them to the ground whoo that's pretty amazing <clears throat> but anyway so my point here is though that takes us to this removal of the day of sacrifice. Look at verse 11. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host. And by him the daily sacrifice was taken away. And the place of his sanctuary was cast down. And an host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression. And it cast down the truth to the ground and it practiced and prospered. So that's the vision. Concerning the daily sacrifice. And the transgression of desolation. It has a starting point when Little Horn begins waxing great. It has a concluding point when Little Horn removes the daily sacrifice, which is connected to this transgression of desolation. Okay, so that's what the vision is. Now we understand that the 2300 days begins when Little Horn makes his appearance and begins waxing great. The 2300 days concludes when Little Horn removes the daily sacrifice, which is connected with this thing called the transgression of desolation, which is why I represent it the way I do, with the image of jealousy, the image of idolatry there, 
which I use the representation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. I can get into that later, and I will. But the removal of the day of sacrifice is on one side. The abomination of desolation is on the other because they are interrelated events. We'll be going into this some more. I like to salt these things in now in little bits and pieces and then build on it and expand up to finally have a complete picture. But what happens is, Little Horn, it, because of his spiritual power, he exalts himself to the prince, the Most High, and he begins casting angelic beings to the ground. I mean, he's got incredible spiritual power. And he, because of transgression, is able to remove the daily sacrifice. So this is where it gets a little tricky. Is this transgression the abomination of desolation? Or is the transgression when the rulers of the Jews enter into a covenant with death and so begins the 70th week? I'll lay all that out for you later and explain why I've concluded the way I have. But because the rulers of the Jews go into league with the man of sin, God turns them over to him. And he then gets a host to take away from them the daily sacrifice and to set up this abomination that make it desolate. That's the way I see this developing. <clears throat> so that's what's going on here. And the Holy Spirit has provided us th this amazing knowledge when we see little horns show up and take out three horns of the fourth beast, that starts the clock. 2,300 days later, we're going to be in the abomination of desolation. Do you have a question, Jim? It's all right. Oh, okay, thank you. They will, they will resume their sacrifices, and the Jews were, or were commanded by Moses to have a morning and an evening sacrifice. That's the daily sacrifice. So they will be... Uh, resuming their sacrificial system. And then Satan's going to get the power to take that away from them. This suggests that they're going to have a great military power that protects them so that nobody could stop them. But when they make a league with Satan, God's going to give a, a host to that devil man that will overcome their army and mow them down and take away their daily sacrifice and he'll call himself God. All right. It begins when Little Horn starts to wax great. Daniel 8, verses 9 and 10. And you see that in Daniel 7, when the ten horns out of this kingdom, that are ten kings, rise, another rises after them. And he will be diverse from the first. He will subdue three of those kings. And he'll speak great words against the Most High and wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and dividing of time, which we shall show means a time is a year, times two years, and a dividing of time half a year. So you have three and one half years. When I speed up a little bit, it's because I'm just dropping that in and we'll come back later and slow down and flush it out. You, you, you've learned that by now. The vision concludes with Little Horn committing the transgression of desolation, also referred to by Daniel as the abomination that maketh desolate. Jesus, in Matthew 24, verse uh, 15, takes those two expressions of Daniel and puts them together and calls it the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet. When Gabriel comes to explain the vision, he said... It begins the time of the end. Look at verse 17, Daniel 8, 17. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and fell upon my face. But he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. What vision? The vision of the evening and the morning. What's that vision about? The daily sacrifice, transgression of desolation. Begin to get all this together here, see. And what Gabriel is revealing to us here is that the vision, which is the vision of the evening and the morning, da, 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 starts a period called the time of the end. That's when it occurs, is at the time of the end. Look at the next verse. Now, as he was speaking with me, <clears throat> uh, I was in a deep sleep on my face toward the ground, but he touched me and set me upright, and he said, Behold, I will make thee to know what shall be in the last end of the indignation. For at the time of the point, uh, uh, the end shall be. Now look, here's what I'm doing for you right now. 
You've watched me over and over and over point to the fourth beast, rise of little horn, time of the end. And then abomination of desolation, last end of the indignation. Well, this is where I get that. All right? The, the angel Gabriel explained to Daniel that this vision concerning the daily sacrifice, which is the vision of little horn coming from one of the four, waxing great and committing the abomination. The angel Gabriel explains this vision occurs at the time of the end. So the beginning point of that vision is the beginning point of the period called the time of the end. And it goes to the abomination of desolation and the angel Gabriel explained, I'm going to tell you uh, about the last end of the indignation. So this time of the end begins and it goes to a period called the last end of the indignation. In other words, as I mentioned at the beginning of the onset of our course, most of us have been through studies that are kind of, they kind of gloss over a lot of this stuff. They just go, boom, 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 here it is. And what we're doing in this study is we're looking very carefully, very closely at where those conclusions come from. See? So we're taking a little more time. In fact, we're taking a lot more time. And we're studying this thing carefully. All right? The time of the end starts when Little Horn begins to wax great and concludes at the last end of the indignation, which begins with the abomination of desolation. And that event provokes God to pour out his indignation. It's the event followed by the outpouring of the seven bowls of wrath. The wrath of God come falling upon the earth after that event. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to get a little bit of time here to kind of give you an overview of Daniel 9 as we conclude this morning. Daniel 9 presents the prophecy of the 70 weeks. Interestingly, the prophecy of the 70 weeks actually continues the prophecy of the vision. Daniel 9 actually continues and finishes the message Daniel was given and recorded in Daniel 8. So the 70 weeks of, uh, upon God's people actually begins in 539. And there are 1,040 days from the time the little horn shows up to when the confirmation of the covenant begins or is, is done, which begins the 70th week. It starts with something called the confirmation of the covenant. And then you've got 1,260 days from that event to the abomination of desolation. And then you've got 42 more months to finish out the 70th week of Daniel. Okay? Gabriel returned to Daniel seven years after he received the vision concerning the daily sacrifice, the transgression of desolation. And he gives him the prophecy of the 70 weeks. So next week, we'll pick it up from there. And we're going to look at the prophecy of the 70 weeks. Let's stand together, please. <clears throat> all right. Father, we are grateful to you for all of your help in guiding us to truth by the Holy Spirit through the scriptures so that we have a clear understanding of these prophetic things and not a lot of fuzzy stuff. And Father, it's my prayer and desire that we might be grounded in the word so firmly that we will not be blown about by every wind of doctrine that comes along in the area of prophecy, but we'll have a good, solid Bible foundation for our understanding. And we won't be deceived when things like the temple gets rebuilt and everybody starts saying, oh, we must be in the tribulation. It's not true. And we've learned enough already to arm us against some of these uh, little triggers, little landmines I believe Satan has planted uh, in many of our churches. They're going to be detonating here in the next some few years, I think. I pray, Father, you'll give us wisdom and understanding of the scriptures. In Jesus' name, amen.